As um, was indicated in my introdu in the introduction, um, I'm a criminal practitioner, and it dawns on me that we're in a public forum, and I thought I'd start out by explaining um, the specifics about how legal aid works if in a criminal context. Um, I'm not a family practitioner, I won't pretend to be one, but basically what I'm going to tell you about how legal aid works, it would be similar in the family law context. Um, first of all, it's important to understand there is no, there, there is some, there's a few lawyers that work for legal aid and provide legal aid services through, through the organization, our, our employees, and they're also lawyers. I'm not one of those. I'm, I'm a private lawyer who happens to take legal aid referrals. Um, so if you came to me uh, for a problem, uh, charged with a criminal offence, I would ask you, one of the questions I would ask you is, do you intend to pay me privately or uh, are you not able to and do you qualify for legal aid? Um, and, and, and then uh, if you did qualify for legal aid, I would, I would accept the referral and we'd go from there and I'd be paid through Legal Services Society. Um, in order to, first thing to understand is not everybody qualifies. There's, there's two fundamental criteria. One is you have to fall below a certain income requirement. And the other one is you have to be seeking, the, the, the Crown has to be seeking a jail sentence, at least in the criminal context. If the Crown's not seeking a jail sentence, you will not qualify for legal aid. And that is really uh, problem number one. And of course, that's a way to limit the number of people who qualify. But um, the difficulty and the challenges that represents for many of my clients is the effects of a criminal record today in a digital era where we have databases where we keep track of everything and anything is actually more significant than it was 20 or 30 years ago, where maybe your criminal record wouldn't pop up uh, in every single situation where you wouldn't, might not want a future employer to know what you did when you were 18 or 19 uh, years of age and some of the mistakes that you made, that's now going to pop up in this digital era forever. So I say actually as the, um, the nature of records becomes more accessible, uh, the need and the importance of having proper legal representation doesn't start with whether or not you are facing a jail sentence, it starts with whether or not you're facing the stigma of a criminal record and the effects that that can have on the rest of your life. Um, I don't, as I say, I don't pretend to know what the criteria are in the family law context, but I do know that certainly income requirement is, is, is one of the uh, uh, criteria there. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, and I'll dispel anybody of, of any myths that you might have about what it's like to work on a legal aid file, um, often I have uh, clients in legal aid context who are mentally ill. That's just the nature of the practice. It's not always the case, but it's often the case, uh, sometimes the case. And I can assure you it's a no-frills defense. Um, I often have a client who will say to me, well, you just, we need to hire a private investigator and then that private investigator can go out and do the, do the work that the police failed to do and we'll get to the bottom of this. And I have to patiently explain to people, I'm your private investigator, I'm it. Uh, there's no frills here. We're not going to get uh, disbursements from legal aid. They're not going to cover these kinds of things. Um, and it's, it's you and me against me and my client against the powers of the state who of course are um, supplied with the powers of the police who can go and investigate uh, matters and frankly um, from what I can see greater resources not unlimited resources but greater resources to come to bear on a prosecution than certainly what I have available to defend uh, on a prosecution and then um, if I accept the referral on, on legal aid um, to, just to describe a little bit about how that works, um, it basically works in terms of the billing. It basically works the same way your doctor bills MSP. So uh, you go for, a, for your annual checkup and your doctor, your family doctor is entitled to bill a certain rate um, for that one hour that he spends with you. Uh, if it's a drop-in checkout, he bills at a different uh, amount. It's basically the same thing uh, with me. If you were in jail and uh, the Crown was seeking your detention and I had to do a bail hearing, I would, be, I would bill out at a certain rate on that bail hearing. It's, it's all fixed on a tariff. And, uh, and it, it fluctuates a little bit depending on whether or not you're charged with a significant offense or, or a, less, a more significant offense or a less significant offense. Larger cases that span several days that are going to take up more court time work on a slightly different uh, system. There we write to legal aid and we say this is the amount of hours that we need to prepare the file and, um, and uh, these are the amount of days that it's going to take to do it and so on and so forth and we set a budget and Legal Aid sends me back a letter saying this is your budget, you're going to get 100 hours or 50 hours or whatever it is for, for, your, for your prep time. And then I would bill that at an hourly rate. The current hourly rate for a criminal tariff file on what we call SCAP 
is $83.90 an hour. Uh, to put that into some perspective, as, as you learned in, in the introduction when I was at Bullhauser and Tupper, as an articling student, my rate was $125 an hour as an articling student. It was more than what I can bill legal, legal services at now. And at one meeting that I attended, we had a debate and, and a discussion about why we couldn't compete, uh, how we couldn't compete with uh, another group of insurance defense lawyers who were charging out at $180 an hour. And we couldn't possibly do the work uh, at, the, at that low of rates. Um, $180 an hour to me sounds uh, pretty good, but in any event, <laughs> That's sort of the context in, in, in which it all works. Um, the other aspect of my practice that I do is duty counsel. So that is where I'm assigned to attend to the courthouse. And those people who don't qualify for legal aid can come in and sit with me and I'll discuss their case with them and give them some advice. I have noticed over the um, six, eight years that I've been doing um, criminal defense and duty counsel work that the number of people who seem not to be qualifying for legal aid is, seems to be increasing. Uh, they're faced with significant, as I say, uh, offenses, criminal, criminal offenses. Uh, they're concerned about the stigma of a criminal record and they do not qualify for any kind of uh, legal uh, representation. Uh, there's a couple of pro bono services that I can refer them to. One of them is uh, through the UBC uh, Law Students Clinic, but again, you're, you're going to get representation through a law student, not through a lawyer. Uh, and it seems to be increasing as time, as time goes by. The concern and the effect for me as a practitioner uh, about what I see happening in terms of legal aid and how it's becoming more restrictive is really twofold. Uh, one concern that I have is that those uh, lawyers who are the stars of the profession uh, will not stay and do criminal defense work. Uh, they are going to go off and get more lucrative jobs in, in private practice and in civil work. And I think that's a shame uh, and that's a, not just a, a bad thing for the criminal bar, uh, for the criminal defense bar. I think it's a bad thing for the justice system generally and I think it's a bad thing for the public. Uh, we want the best lawyers working variety. We don't expect to have uh, necessarily all the same amount of good lawyers doing criminal defense work because it, frankly it doesn't pay as much and you can go get paid better uh, doing civil work but there is going to be over time uh, bleeding out of the stars of the profession they're not going to stay and, and continue to do uh, criminal defense work which is unfortunate. The other area that uh, we're seeing um, some, some serious problems with respect to legal aid is on major cases including uh, murder cases where when I started and, and really where I learned uh, my trade was juniorine senior lawyers on uh, murder cases and more serious cases. Um, and what you're seeing now is budget restraints from legal aid where you, I mean it was almost automatic when I started, you'd write in, you'd write your budget proposal and you'd, you'd be assigned junior counsel. Uh, now that's not the case. Now it's generally, uh, it's assumed that you're going to be doing the case on your own. Uh, and unless you can convince uh, legal aid that there's somehow exceptional circumstances, uh, I think, the, frankly, the exceptional circumstances when you're facing significant offenses is that your client could face a, a life sentence in jail. Uh, that's enough uh, to justify uh, junior counsel in my view. Uh, but uh, uh, that's not the case and that's not the way they uh, view it and the budget restraints have become uh, more uh, significant over time. And, um, the, and of course, that's, uh, that's a problem because um, then the quality of the representation and the challenges uh, with, respect to the, with respect to the representation uh, becomes more significant. So, um, in, Bergie is going to talk, I think, I hope, a little bit about um, what's been happening with the, the, the budget over the last 20 years. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what the bar is doing about all of this. Um, Back in September of 2011, we called a meeting. I'm a member of what's called the Legal Aid Action Committee, which is a subcommittee of a group of called the Trial Lawyers Association of British Columbia, um, which uh, Birgit and I are both members of. And a member uh, a meeting was called back in September of 2011 to discuss the state of legal aid amongst the bar, and um, mostly with respect to Criminal Defense Council, but not exclusively. There was lots of turnout from the Family Bar and uh, some civil practitioners as well. And what we wanted to canvas was whether or not there was an appetite to do anything about um, the state of legal aid in the province of British Columbia, and it turned out that there was. So the first thing that we did was starting in January of 2012, we started withdrawing 
um, duty council services. So we would agree that we would not attend to do duty council, both in custody and out of custody duty council. We started that in January of 2012, doing one week. We stepped up to two weeks in February, three weeks in March, and four weeks in April. And we had mixed successes with that. Um, one of the challenges that we face is that we are all, as I say, private members. You can agree to join or not join if just because one lawyer says, uh, I'm not gonna agree to do legal aid services, does, uh, provide legal services, doesn't mean that another lawyer can make another decision and do it. And in fact, what we had was, we had replacements come in and, and do those duty council services in some of the jurisdictions, not all of them, but in some of them. So the lesson that we learned from the withdrawal of duty council services in, in 2012 was that um, it, it's of mixed results and in some of the jurisdictions they were replaced. Following that, we uh, had a collective uh, decision amongst most members not to take any of the riot cases following the, the, uh, the uh, uh, Stanley Cup uh, riots that occurred. We wouldn't take any of those cases on, on legal aid. And again, people don't have to participate in that. Others uh, could choose to do it if they wanted. But, and also, we then stepped that up to include uh, no criminal harassment charges. Um, and then um, more recently, what's been proposed and what we're, what we're touring around the province to various different lawyers is the idea that we're going to do uh, weekly blackout rates, um, blackout periods. So in July of this year, the um, criminal defense bar that practices primarily out of 222 Main Street um, agreed that we would not attend for the month of July. We took extended holidays. And uh, we just would not go in and, and, and do anything, the idea being to um, slow the system down if possible and cause problems and get the government's attention. And um, it, you may have seen some of the media reports that, that uh, came out of that. I hope you did. Um, However, the, the challenge, of course, is not showing up for work for a month costs everybody money. In fact, it costs everybody too much money. And so the appetite to, to follow through with that length of withdrawal is, is simply not there because people can't financially afford it, understandably so. So what we're doing now, starting in October, is one week a month on the first week, starting the Monday of the first week, uh, first uh, week of the month, um, we're going to do weekly blackout periods. So we will uh, not be setting matters down for trial in that first week. Uh, we will not be attending to, um, uh, if, if the file is for resolution by way of guilty plea or some other resolution, we will not be resolving it in the week uh, during that uh, blackout uh, period. And unless it's an emergency situation uh, where your client's absolutely insisting on a bail hearing, we're also not going to do uh, bail hearings in that period of time, which means people will sit in jail for the week. What we're hoping the result of that is, is that the week following the blackout period uh, is frankly a mess for the courts. That provincial court is, list is overloaded uh, the following week, um, thereby um, frankly getting the attention of judges who will hopefully start to complain and then get the attention of uh, the government. The idea is to sort of uh, quash uh, our four weeks of work into three weeks of work, thereby disrupting the system a little bit. Uh, it's supposed to be provincial and Supreme Court um, uh, job action. So uh, if you've got a matter in uh, Supreme Court and you've agreed to uh, withdraw your services uh, in accordance with the blackouts, that you'd also be, the lawyers would also be withdrawing their services for the, for the uh, in Supreme Court. Um, we're hoping and trying to get the family bar also on board. They seem to be supportive. Uh, one of the things that we are concerned about is that if criminal practitioners withdraw their services for those blackout periods, uh, the judicial case managers who handle all the scheduling in court could just backfill that with family matters. So it's important that if there are any family practitioners here, um, that uh, you're aware of uh, our, our job action and hopefully uh, support us. We're also going to be reaching out to the civil bar uh, so that the civil bar uh, um, will uh, uh, support us as well. Um, we have um, canvassed the various jurisdictions. I can tell you who's on board uh, with our job action, Vancouver, Richmond, Surrey, North Vancouver, Nanaimo, Victoria, Kamloops, and smaller jurisdiction of Belmont and Mackenzie's on board. Uh, we've reached out to Abbotsford and Port Coquitlam, and we're waiting for those lawyers to get back to us with, uh, with respect to their responses. Thank you. What I have to say will dovetail on many things that you've already heard, at least that's my hope. Um, I practice almost exclusively in provincial court and uh, the numbers of self-represented lit litigants in provincial court are 
markedly different from what we've heard in the Supreme Court. Um, and these are numbers that came out of the Chief Justice's office, so they're quite reliable. 40% uh, of criminal litigants in British Columbia's provincial courts are unrepresented. That's a staggering amount, 40%. And uh, unlike in Supreme Court, I don't think that they do this by choice. They do this because they don't qualify for legal aid. And we'll get, uh, I'll probably have a little bit more specifics as, specifics as to why they couldn't get legal aid. It gets even more depressing uh, on the civil side. In, in BC's provincial court, uh, on the civil side, 90% of the litigants are self-represented. And if that's not depressing enough, there's family, 95%. And if, generally speaking, if one side's represented and the other isn't, we can be pretty sure most of the time it will be the woman who doesn't have a lawyer. So these, this is the reality of where most of the cases in BC actually take place, that the overwhelming um, numbers of people are there without a lawyer. I, I don't have the number in my head at the moment, but um, as to how many cases are tried in provincial courts in BC versus the Supreme Court, but it's in the high 90s. I think it's 96% get dealt with in provincial court. So that's, that's, that's really, that's really the heart of the situation. So, so many people are unrepresented, and that's what judges have to deal with every day. And Anthony and I just get to rep represent some of the people who are lucky enough to qualify. So let me just uh, shock you even more as to what the financial eligibility uh, cutoffs are, and they are so on the family and on the criminal side. If you are a single person in British Columbia, it doesn't matter geographically whether it's Mandahoof or Vancouver. If you make more than $1,480 a month gross, you are expected to pay for your own lawyer. Just do the arithmetic. A single mom in BC, if she makes more than $2,070 a month gross, and there's an access issue with her children, she doesn't need a lawyer. The numbers go on and on. If a three-person family, the monthly income exceeds $2,670, you are representing yourself. So um, I have just today received numbers as to how BC fares in terms of our per capita spending on legal aid. And um, we're not doing well Canada, compared to other provinces and territories in Canada. So at the very bottom, spending even less than uh, BC, is New Brunswick, uh, PEI, and by a small margin, Alberta. They spend $12.64 uh, per person on legal aid. BC spends $13.51 on legal aid. <coughs> Bigger spenders than us are Quebec, Saskatchewan, Manitoba, 1849, Nova Scotia, 1951, Ontario, 2108, Newfoundland, 2308, uh, and then uh, the territories up north spent much, much, much more than that, obviously, because of the geographical challenges. The Nunavut spends $201 per person on legal aid. So that's where we've how that's how we're comparing to um, the rest of Canada. Um, what does it mean when people, when the majority of people in our courts, for the majority of cases, are unrepresented? Uh, first of all, let me just say that for those of us who might think that unrepresented accused in provincial court, uh, aside from the problems that Anthony has um, highlighted that nothing much is going to happen to them, um, not so. 70% of them are found guilty, and of those, over a third go to jail. No lawyer. Yeah, that's, that, that really is shocking. So, 
I have a solution to uh, the government's insistent, insistence that uh, we don't have any uh, money for legal aid. And, and I acknowledge that there are national and international pressures on governments everywhere. First of all, of course, <laughs> there is the matter of the $147 million that the government collected last year on uh, legal fees that both parties of, this, uh, of our province at one point or another have insisted goes to a fund, uh, should go to fund legal aid and never, not for a moment, has it gone to legal aid. It has always ended up in uh, general revenue and now uh, our government says that uh, despite the $147 million, we don't have any money for legal aid. So uh, let me say that the actual money that came out of our provincial government's pockets, our pockets I guess, to fund legal aid last year in VC was $61.5 million. So it's more than twice the amount they collect that is not being spent on legal aid. Uh, I have another solution to the problem as to how we can finance legal aid adequately. Um, and that's give everybody a lawyer and get rid of the, civil, uh, of the unrepresented litigants. I am very, very indebted to Sharon uh, Matthews uh, from the Canadian Bar Association. She has written, uh, compiled two brilliant papers that are, I'm sure, very easily accessible through the Canadian Bar Association. And she just has painstakingly gone through the amount of money it costs, or a good estimate as to how much it costs to nurse all these unrepresented litigants through our courts uh, when really they are not equipped to do so. So first of all, as you can imagine, there is, if you just look at the money, there's a tremendous amount of court time wasted because people just don't know how to do things, nor should they. It's sort of, just imagine this whole thing in the medical uh, field, you know, you, you're sent to the hospital, but uh, we don't, we can't afford for a doctor, so you get a manual, a pamphlet that tells you when to stand up and when to sit down, but that's really not, not effective. So in any event, Shara Matthews uh, took studies that, uh, there are studies from uh, common law countries, all of them actually, many of them, uh, uh, that have just, that have quantified how much uh, it costs to have people unrepresented in court. Uh, all, I, I grant you that all these studies are not in the, in the criminal context, but in the civil context, but they, we can assume that the, the principles are the same. So um, conservative accounting firms have um, just assumed that there is a delay of 20% if an unrepresented accused represents themselves versus a person who's represented by counsel. Now for those of us who are in court, uh, that's ridiculous, really. It's, it's, it has to be several times the amount of time an unrepresented litigant uses court time. Judges have to explain everything. They have to explain the rules of evidence. They have, there are so many adjournments, there are so many more court appearances for unrepresented people because they're trying so often to just get a lawyer somehow. Uh, so that if we're assuming there's a delay of 20%, then that is extremely conservative. But just let's go with the 20%. Sharon Matthews does the arithmetic for us. She says, we know how much a, a provincial court judge costs. That's, pub that's public knowledge. We know how much a court clerk costs. We know how much it costs to keep the lights running in a, in a courtroom. We know how much a sheriff costs. We know how much a crown costs. And uh, she quantified how much, uh, how much we're spending uh, in British Columbia's courts, how much more court time we're spending if we're assuming that the, all these unrepresented litigants are, are wasting 20% of court, court time. And she comes up with the amount, the very conservative amount of, we're wasting $50 million a year just because these unrepresented people are spending way too much court time than if they had a lawyer. So, I say, give all these underrepresented people a lawyer through legal aid, give legal aid the $50 million, we've solved all of our problems, and the court system will run more efficiently. Works for me. Uh, <laughs> uh, apparently the government doesn't see it, so we've, uh, we've, uh, we've uh, 
the government insists that there, there have to be absolutely, uh, there have to be more studies. Uh, so th that's probably not going, going to be happening anytime soon. Um, we have already heard of the Doust Commission on Legal Aid. The commissioner says that we're, f we're failing even the most, uh, failing British Columbians and even their most basic legal needs. And when it comes to his recommendation that, uh, that le legal aid be declared an essential public service, which is really a linchpin of, uh, of his report, um, very often critics uh, say that, well, the public really, really isn't behind that. Not true. Legal Services commissioned uh, an Ipsos Reid report, which I can only assume was occasioned by uh, the government is, the commissioner's uh, recommendation that it be declared an essential public service and in the in the uh, survey there was one question do you support uh, legal aid becoming an essential pu public service uh, along health care education and uh, social services and uh, British Columbians responded 74 percent said yes so the public does understand what it means to be unrepresented in court. The public does understand that when people really do need a lawyer, it's not a frill, uh, that the system isn't designed for us to represent ourselves unless you've gone to law school. Um, and, uh, and I think it's time for the government to um, put the money where it should be going. Um, that's what I have to say. Thank you.